Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 320 for Monday, September 27th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by for and about working musicians, as always here, as usual. I don't want to say always, but as usual here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. How uh, how was your weekend, Mr. Kent? I had a remarkably awesome weekend. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> it was. I mean, we had we had two gigs. We had a gig on Saturday and Sunday. The Saturday was a gig that booked pretty recently down at the beach. Um, We've played this stage several times before. It was kind of a newer festival that, that knew us from an older festival. Sure. And that's the one I, I I actually, I want to talk about both gigs really, really briefly, but the Saturday gig at the beach. So every time we get a chance to play down there, it's a joy. I mean, it's just, it's exciting to be right on the beach. You know, they're so receptive to music. The stage is awesome. The people who come out are awesome. The tourists who are there just enjoy the beach, you know, kind of see something special is going on. And, you know, the, we could kind of subtext this as, you know, what are the things that go to make a make an amazing gig, right? You know, you know, your band can play. Sure. What has to happen for the stars to line up for to be one of those? And I would actually say, and I told the guys this, that gig on Saturday may have been the best house record gig ever. That's delightful. I mean, well, that's it. I mean, you, you know, we've played 22 years, you know, how many thousands of gigs? And this one was just a combination of sound on stage was incredible. Sound out front was incredible. Parking was not a problem, which it often is at this one. That's delightful. Um, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Um, you know, everybody came, you know, with in, in just excited to play at the beach. Um as soon as we played the first note, all of a sudden people started descending on this dance floor, you know, probably enough room for about four or 500 people. And pretty much from note one on, uh, it was, the energy was just building. Like every little sticky thing we do got a tremendous response from the crowd, which just built the energy even more. Band played fantastic. So it, you know, it was one of those things where every star lined up and by the end of it, we were like, what the heck just happened? I mean, that yeah. was, that was just amazing. Like, you know, you have good gigs and you kind of expect good gigs, but you know, what are the ones that take it up into the stratosphere? And this yep. was one of the ones where just everything was awesome. That's and, great, man. Uh, that's, yeah, that, it's it nice so to have fun. one of those every now and then. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 We hope for, we, we hope for everyone now and then. Yeah. And you know, some of this, I think was Bill, you know, we really are most comfortable when our sound guy using our equipment does sound for us. I, it, right? it, it, I think that's what I was saying last week, or if I wasn't saying it, I was thinking it, you know, when we, we played the bitter pill gig and I just sat down and like the mix was perfect. And it's like, yeah, like this is, this is how we, it, we it's better this way. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It's more work. Yeah, well, it's way. comfort. It's, it's, it's a but velvet glove, man. That's it's it. Just... Yeah. Cause it's dialed in for you and it's, it's, you know, you've, if we've, you know, like with Bitter Pill, if we played, whatever I said it was, 17 gigs this summer or something like that, 18 gigs, more than half of them, we did our own sound. So that means, you know, we did, let's say nine of them with our, 10 of them with our own PA and then every other, so 10 gigs with our PA and then other gigs with you know, nine other gigs or eight other gigs, whatever it was with eight other PAs. You don't have the opportunity to dial it in when it's a one-off. Right. right. And so that's, yeah, it, for us, it's a lot more work, I, I guess for you guys too, I'm sure, you know, to set up your own PA and all that stuff, but it, it's a, it's unless something goes wrong, it is a very predictable process. And that in and of itself is comfortable, right? You know, we're humans. We we're creatures of habit. We like those things, but yeah. it also just makes it so that you're getting to the gig and it's like, Oh, okay. I don't have to negotiate with the sound guy, you know, not that that's a bad thing, but it's extra work that I have to do. You know, we all have to do, Hey, can I have this? Can I do this? You know, and I've I, talked about that, but the stepping through of the building trust very quickly process, like that's effort. And, and it's a little stressful. I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, debilitatingly stressful, but 
it's extra stress, right? It's like, okay, am I going to get what I need for this gig? And you don't know the answer until somewhere about halfway through the gig. And that's always the that's kind exactly of exactly right. Yeah. And that's yeah. What, what we're saying is, you know, even in our, you know, semi-professional existence, the less stress, the better performance, right? You know, the more that Fair. you can just walk in, plug yeah. in and, you know, turn on and go, you're focused on what you do. I, I don't know about you, but in my mind, when one thing goes wrong, I'm now thinking about the other things that might go wrong and how I might have to ad adapt to that. So my, my brain is a little bit preoccupied Absolutely. With, with problem solving until I hit a comfort zone. Right. Yeah. Oh, same. I mean, and that, I mean, that's just how my mind works all the time anyway. But, uh, so yes, if, if things can just go smoothly and predictably, that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah, great. Saturday was, was remarkable. And then Sunday was, it was a real treat and it's kind of funny. Sunday was a festival gig. So again, very short turnover, but a, a sound person, uh, we played this festival for the past 10 or 11 years. And the sound person there is a good friend of ours and knows us very well. And Bill brings our board. And so we do do that pigtail thing and, you know, yep. he's controlling monitor mix. Um, you know, it, it's funny because I've been complaining the last couple of shows about, you know, I just can't do a show if I don't have an hour of setup time. Well, this one, because all the parts, you know, the band before us got off the stage quickly, Bill was running the stage turnover, you know, so we about 30, 35 minutes and yeah. we were up and, you know, again, all our, our mix presets were there and ready for us to go and, and we hit it. And so the funny thing is we changed a couple things. And so the first lesson from Sunday's gig is the band before us, good band called fill in the blanks. And I just want to give them a, a little nod because they're, you know, in the same scene that I'm in and they were playing their last gig because their, uh, their owner, their founder, their band leader is moving out of the area story you've heard before. Uh -huh. And um, so they did a farewell gig in, in that town, uh, Los Altos, California, and they killed it. I mean, they were just, you know, very emotional and just really dialed in, but there is that rock fill in band. the blanks with a pH. P H I L N the blanks. Yeah, I got it. Okay, great. We put a link in and, the show notes uh, for you. Yeah, my my buddy Phil Wiseman, you know, he just poured his heart out saying goodbye to you know friends and family. It was really fun to follow them that for that show. Yeah. Anyway, they um they're typically a a good classic, great classic rock band. The, the good is good predictably. It's classic rock. Uh, repertoire. So, you know, a lot of Journey, some Kansas, some Van Halen, you know, th and they play that type of stuff. But then all of a sudden they played, and I didn't even think to do something that I usually do, which is compare set lists with a band that I'm sharing a bill with to make sure we don't repeat stuff. And all of a sudden they play Uptown Funk, which of course everybody plays, but I had no clue, no thought that these guys were going to play Uptown Funk. So I didn't even, I didn't ask, right? And um, there they go. So we had to, we, it's usually our second song and we had to move it um, we made a game time decision. We're, we'll just take it out now and we'll play it a little bit later in the show. And, and, you know, it's, I don't think, I don't think people go into shows or that surprised to hear Uptown Funk more than once in an afternoon, but, um, and ours is, is, it was a little different style than theirs, but anyway, I haven't seen your fastball yet. So that's exactly right. Man. Sorry. I couldn't resist. <laughs> Perfect. No, that's, that's why we invented that. Right. So, uh, well, actually technically we invented that for, for sweet home Alabama, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. That's right. But, right. but, 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 but Uptown Funk is the sweet home Alabama of, of today's generation. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, we made a game time decision to, you know, juggle our set list a little bit and put a couple things in. And uh, after coming off the amazing Nirvana of the day before, um, just a couple changes. I know personally, my head was thinking about, am I remembering, you know, this and what goes there a little bit in the first two or three songs. I personally was a little janky on, mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh, did I lose Did I leave all the magic yesterday? <laughs> and so I was like, but then, then, but then we kind of got our, our groove going and the rest of the day was great. And again, it's a, it's like, it's just kind of a hometown crowd because we played it for so many years yeah. and there's a lot of love going. And, uh, I say one of the, I, I'm loving how much butter my band is, is bathing in right now, but the end of our show, the last 30 minutes is just really fun for me. It's just, the energy is great. The songs flow, the audience gets it. And, uh, you know, and we're playing everything from, some classic Stevie Wonder to, you know, like Call Me Al by Paul Simon. And and uh, and then actually our encore is Twist and Shout, 
shout and love train. So, you know, pretty old school stuff, a little bit departure from the other stuff that we do. And, uh, and, uh, but you know, it's just, I mean, you call it old stuff. Our, our encore generally with bitter pill is Minnie the moocher. So, <laughs> you know, we go a little bit further back, but you know, I, I got, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about just real quick. I'm thinking about, you know, how to, how to create a, a process by which we can talk about new songs for next year. And I think about what do we do well? Yeah. We are a high energy man. That is our thing. So I, our set list flows really well now. So if you want to suggest a song, where does it go in this kind of structure and flow that we have for our shows? Um, a familiar song. You know, I say to the guys, we're a house party band. That's that's what we are. And then it dawns on me that I have 10 different opinions about what a house party is, right? And so Minnie the Moocher may get suggested before too. I mean, we do. We've that's had- a great um, song, man. Everybody, everybody sings along. Like- uh, It is a great song. Right? Like, it's just- it, So it's, that's one kind of house party, right? Yeah. Just get everybody drunk and sing along to old songs. We do We do Fly Me to the Moon sometimes, you know, the, the, like the original arrangement yeah. because we have five horns. And, uh, and that's kind of fun. It's kind of like a different unexpected departure. Although I said our, what our encore is, but actually if we have time, the very last song we throw in is Enter Sandman, which, you know, sure. people's minds explode. I mean, we, I definitely, I see some people like grabbing their stuff and leaving like, oh no, that, that that's too heavy music ah. for me. <laughs> and other people just throwing horns and just getting crazy about it. So it's, it's good. You know, it's kind of fun, but anyway, all good stuff gets you excited to keep good. creating and, you know, progressing the band's journey, you know, when you're feeling really good, the juice is just flowing. Like I, I, I want to even take it to a higher level. And that's kind of what the task I'm on over the next couple of months is to figure out how we can make it even better. That's great, man. That, no, yeah. that's what, that's a good weekend. Yeah. I, um, I had no gigs this weekend. I, it, it, it wasn't intentionally done this way, but it wound up, it was my birthday weekend. I turned, uh, 50 actually on Friday. And, uh, and there was, I don't know, somebody, there was some reason we didn't have gigs this weekend. I'm not sure what it was, but, um, but it was, so I had the weekend off, but Friday night, well, Friday night was one reason I'm sure we didn't have gigs, uh, back in February of 2020, actually, when I was on an airplane to Mexico, I bought tickets for Primus. They were, they had just announced that they were doing, uh, they were as part of their show for that tour. Uh, it was, they were going to play the entirety of Russia's a farewell to Kings. It's a great record. And, uh, and it had been a long time since I'd seen Primus. In fact, the last time I saw Primus was, I think, sometime in the 90s. Maybe it may have been late 80s, but I think it was 90s opening for Rush. And I thought, oh, OK, well, this would be good. And then it, obviously with COVID and everything, it was it was postponed uh, not once but twice and wound up landing <clears throat> on my birthday, which was a nice night out. Lisa and I went out and actually I ran into an old friend from high school who I think we had seen Rush and Primus together back in in those days and um you know, and we bent and saw Rush a bunch together. So it was nice to kind of catch up with, with an old friend by surprise. But when we bought the tickets, it was basically the same price to buy tickets that were uh, VIP Q and a experience uh, versus not. And I think in order to have tickets somewhere in the first 10 rows or something, that's just how it was. And they weren't terribly expensive. So we wound up having this, this Q and a, before the show with uh, all three members of Primus. And it truly was a Q and a, they came out for about 45 minutes and just answered questions. Like it, they, they had nothing to say. There was no, uh, you know, announcement or whatever. Les Claypool started it off by saying, all right, look, if nobody wants to answer, ask a question, we're just going to start before we even let you ask a question. Why did we choose this record? And they kind of went into their choices. And so I asked the first real question because nobody really wanted to step up, but you know, me microphone, pff, that's kind of how it works. And, uh, and I asked him what it was like touring during COVID specifically, you know, how tight did they need to keep their bubbles? I was surprised that they were even doing these Q and A's, right. But it was outdoors, uh, they were unmasked, but easily 10 feet from the closest human uh, and the rest and all of us in attendance were there and and masked. And there was maybe 50 of us or something like that for this this q and It wasn't a huge amount of people. But um, but they said that, you know, things are they, they explain their reasons, you know, for like I think they less explained how his wife has asthma and, you know, his kids are too young or can't be vaccinated or whatever. And so. Uh, but also that, 
you know, if any one of them or anybody on the crew that's close to them winds up getting infected, it cancels the rest of the tour. That means, you know, of course, the fans that wanted to see him can't see him, but also the people that wanted to work can't work. And now also someone's sick. Right. You know, so there's all these things. And they said, so they're keeping their bubbles really tight. You know, he was talking about how on his days off, he would like go in the middle of nowhere and go fishing or whatever. So he loves to go fly fishing. And so um, th that thankfully, that's something he can sort of do in lots of places and doesn't generally expose him to people. So but it was really interesting to hear how, you know, how it's different. Like they they don't really get to go out and, you know, enjoy the towns that they are playing in like they might otherwise normally do um so it was it was it was interesting and then timely with that was the rest of the q a was weird it was primus folks so you have to understand that the, the fact that you know we wound up also talking about semen and and getty lee's i don't even know what the right way to say this is A you woman, said you said semen right i did i'm not proud uh but i did <laughs> yeah because they brought it up and uh, and so then I had to bring it up again when it was timely because they appreciated those sorts of uh, witty little things. But um, a woman asked, tell us something about Getty Lee that nobody knows. And Les decided that it was it was a good thing to talk about. Um, Getty Lee's incredible length was, oh, was what he really kind of wanted to go into there. Yeah. But it's his primus, right? They, I mean, like that, that's who these guys are. And, and they, they, they are a band. Like, I mean, obviously they're a band. They've been a band for decades, but they are a band like any other band. They are just cutting up, having a blast with each other, trying to one up each other and this whole thing. So it was, it was fun. Uh, not so fun was that the next day, uh, the Trey Anastasio band announced that one of their horn players came down with COVID, uh, and and I had noticed just from social media pictures and things like that, that it didn't seem like they were keeping their bubble all that tight. Um, you know, band members were just kind of seen, you know, taking pictures with fans in like restaurants and things like that, you know, where yeah. they were just out and about. So this didn't surprise me entirely, but they wound up, they already had one of their horn players was being subbed out for this tour because he was recovering from, uh, I think, cancer surgery or chemotherapy or something like that. Uh, and he's going to, they said that, you know, he, they expect him to make a, a full recovery, but obviously, you know, touring was going to be too much for him. And so mm -hmm. they already had one sub and then to lose another horn player. Who's also one of the harmony singers, Jen Hartswick. Uh, she's the one that came down with COVID really talented person, uh, just a great musician. So they, they took the horns out of the rest of the tour. So it's, it's just, uh, I guess a five piece. Sure. Now. Yeah. But it was like, yeah, this is, I mean, th th it's not surprising, even if they were to keep their bubbles tight, like it's still possible for these things to happen. So it's a, it's an, in, it was an interesting weekend in terms of just, you know, getting that sort of information about, yeah, we have to remember as we're out playing these gigs that, you know, we are exposing, potentially exposing ourselves to lots of different bubbles that are all intersecting that day. And we need to be really aware of, you know, are we going to go and shake people's hands or, you know, even just interact, maybe fist bumps. I don't shake people's hands at gigs or really much at all anymore. But, you know, is there what what level of interaction are you going to have with the people that come out to your gigs? And it's tough to not interact because, you you know, it's kind of part of the deal, except that it might mean the next gig doesn't happen. So it's, yeah, yeah it's I, an know, interesting I, thing. Yeah. Well, the gig we did on Sunday was really crowded. Well, actually, both of them were really crowded. And, yeah. and a friend of mine who I haven't seen for a while sent some pictures, but they were kind of far away. And she goes, you know, nice to see you guys, but I was not about to get in the middle of this super spreader event. And, yeah, you know, you kind of hit with the with the reality that, Yes, we are not through this yet. We're going on as though we are, you know, and I, I'm as guilty of it as anybody. Like, you know, people come up and want to say hi and congratulate you after a show and want to take a picture and, and all that type of stuff. Yeah. And you forget like this life or death thing has been going on for now 18 months or more than 18 months. Yep. And, and uh, you know, keeping a bubble is hard. It wasn't it, hard. It's hard. It wasn't that hard, you know, in, in March, April, May of, of 2020. No, but, when we weren't you know, doing anything, it was, it was right. way easier. I don't want to say it was easy, but it was not nearly as hard as it is now. Yeah. That's and right. I think, 
I think that that you know, based on what we're seeing, this isn't going to go away. We're just going to need to learn how to live with it and get comfortable with, you know, some level of that risk. I always, you know, part of what I tell myself is, well, it's still driving to and from as a, as a vaccinated person of, of, you know, the ripe age of 50, still the most dangerous thing that I'm doing when I play a gig is driving to and from the gig. Like statistically speaking, if something's going to kill me, uh, it's probably going to be, you know, an auto accident and not, a, you know, me contracting COVID or some other disease from someone at the gig. But right. it's still a thing like, you, you know, I, I have to have that conversation with myself. And it doesn't mean that I'm I'm, you know, completely throwing caution to the wind either. It's just all right. We got to frame this the right way. And, and we all have to sort of do this for ourselves. And it's it's you know, it's an evolution and we're learning as we go. And it and yeah. and we're not alone. Right. I mean, look at these, you know, two touring bands that are out there at the, you know, the highest level and still sort of struggling with the same thing that we are yeah. playing our little gigs around here. Yeah. Hey, we had a couple of questions. Um, in fact, we have a couple of questions for you. If you would go to giggabpodcast.com slash survey and fill out our listener survey, that will help us immensely, both in learning in aggregate, who you are as our audience, which is super helpful to us. But also there's some specific questions about the show that are just for me and Paul to hear from you. So please go to giggabpodcast.com slash survey. But we did get some questions from you, including one from Brian, who uh, who emailed us at feedback at giggabpodcast.com and says, I recently discovered the show and have been listening nonstop. Uh, Dave, I am particularly interested in your experience as a singing drummer because I too am a drummer who sings or a singer who drums. I don't know, but I am kind of new at all this. And I wonder if you would tell me what gear you use to accomplish this. And he asked some, for instance, questions, or actually I should say, for example, questions, uh, what mic, what's your microphone of choice? And does it have a particular polar pattern? Uh, what kind of mic stand do you use? And does it have a gooseneck or a telescoping boom? Uh, any preference on XLR cables? And so, uh, yes, I have answers to all of these things. So in terms of microphones, you know, you do need to be super aware of what else is happening around the mic, right? Because if you're, if you're singing and the mic is directly in front of you, then you want a mic that doesn't pick up anything on the other side of the mic, a.k.a. all of your drums and cymbals. It's still going to pick up some, even if you have a mic with a really tight pattern. But, you know, you want to you want to minimize that. If you're, you know, a Taylor Hawkins style singing drummer where you turn to the side, then you want to make sure you have things that are like a super tight pattern. But maybe you don't care about the off axis stuff as, as much. The off axis being the thing directly in front of you uh, when you're singing into the microphone. And so you want to want to look at that. I have the mic. Uh, in front of me. So my drums are, I am looking at my drums while I'm singing into the microphone. So for me, that means I avoid anything hypercardioid um, and even some super cardioid mics because a, hyper, uh, a cardioid pattern is named that way because it's shaped like a heart. Okay. So the, the sort of dimple of the heart is where the microphone is. And then it comes out in a bubble around the front of it. A hypercardioid has a little bubble on the other side of the dimple of the heart. So if you think of an apple, think of where the stem comes out. Hypercardioid mics have a pickup uh, pattern that, that includes things exactly off axis where that stem would come out. And that is exactly the wrong thing for someone who has drums that are loud right on the other side of it. And so I look for drum for mics that have a cardioid or the right super cardioid pattern. And you can look people like they show you the picture of the pattern. And hopefully now that I've described it to you, you can kind of take a look and figure it out. F but then beyond the pattern, you just got to find a mic that sounds good with your voice. So I, you know, for me, it's the Heil PR 31s, uh, PR 31 BW, which is the short version of the Heil PR 30. It's a larger di diaphragm, um, uh, dynamic microphone, although it kind of sounds like a condenser. It does not need phantom power. It needs a little bit of gain. Actually, it doesn't need a terrible amount of gain, but, um, but I, I like that mic. It is technically a super cardioid, but it has almost no pickup on the, you know, we'll call it the stem of the Apple, but you got to find a mic that sounds good for your voice and, and has a pattern that you're comfortable singing into. So that's, that's, you know, 
that, that's I guess that's my answer there. Um, answer. Yeah. In terms of microphone stand, I usually use a rack with my drums and that means I don't need to worry about um, leverage tipping over my mic stand because I clamp my mic stand to my rack. I don't even have a have feet on my mic stand. I've, I've taken them off. So I just have uh, a mic stand that clamps onto my rack like any of my drums or cymbals would. And then it goes up. And comes straight over my head. And then so it's got a telescoping boom that goes way over and then drops down with a gooseneck straight in front of me. So it's out of the way of my hands. The gooseneck drops down and I use a right angle XLR so that there's not this cable sticking way out for my sticks to hit as I'm flailing about on the other side of this thing. And that that works really well. And you don't need anything special or I haven't found I need anything special. I just, you know, know that you it's a mic stand and you have lots of moving parts. So either have spare parts or replace it once a year, once every other year so that it doesn't fall apart on you. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, anyway, and in terms of XLRs, I, I don't know what your feelings are on this, Paul. I have, I have standardized on Monoprice's XLRs for the last, I'll say 10 plus years, and they have proven to be super reliable. My, the biggest problem I have with them is that sometimes the screws that hold the, uh, the connectors onto the cable, will start to loosen. So I just have a little screwdriver in my case and I tighten them up, but they have those modern price. They are inexpensive and super reliable. So. I haven't bought, uh, you know, Bill, Bill takes care of whatever is sound gear we want, but I bought monoprice guitar cables and been really yeah. happy with them. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. They, they, they know what they're doing over there. So I've, I've been, I've been super happy with, uh, with all their stuff. So, Yeah. <laughs> All right. You got anything else on that one? I know that. It's, I mean, it's, you know, this is like some. No, I'm just letting you drummers to talk drummers. to each other. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, like, you know, I, do you have, I guess you don't have to worry about, well, you, you know, even for, uh, you know, someone who's singing up at the front of the stage, if you've got monitor wedges, you need to be careful of, you need to be aware of what pattern your microphone has in terms of where you place that monitor wedge. If you've got a regular cardioid, so just the heart shape with no stem on the apple. Uh, then having a monitor wedge directly in front of you works out great because you're not picking up anything, you know, w w what's considered off axis, the thing directly mm -hmm. on the other side of the mic. But if you have a hypercardioid mic, then that will squeal with feedback if you start to gain it up at all. Because if you have a monitor wedge in front of you, you want that monitor wedge off to one side or the other. Or if you're spoiled, you can have monitor wedges on both sides of you if you like. Oh, actually, I actually don't know the answer, so I'll ask you the question. So I have a yeah. Beta 58 is what I typically sing through. Beta 58. Yep. Most gigs, I will have one monitor in front of me. Some gigs, I will have two monitors off about 45 degrees, you know, on either side of me angled up towards me. Okay. Uh, I am looking up the Beta 58. I don't know its pattern uh, off the top of my head. Wow. Do they not show? Sure's sight doesn't make it easy to see what the pattern looks like on this thing. Huh. Fascinating. You know, come on. Sure. It's gotta be somewhere. I mean, it's yeah. You one, one would think. One of the most common mics in the world. Yeah. 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 I'm looking here. Details, how it works. Product. Yep. Placement girl reviews. Oh, here we go. Specs. Beta 58 spec sheet. Yeah, it's just buried down. At the I see. What kind of, of pickup pattern does an SM58 have? A, car a cardioid pickup pattern. It I is a. The main sound. It, it looks like a hypercardioid uh, pickup pattern. As I'm looking at it, there's a pretty big bubble on the opposite side of that. I don't. They. They don't. Um, as I'm as I'm looking at it while we're talking here, which is it's difficult to read and talk at the same time if you've never tried. Uh, yeah, they call it a tight supercardioid pattern. So it does have a pickup on the off axis. So if you are in a, especially if you're indoors, I would move that monitor wedge off to the side, um, especially if you're starting to, you know, experience some feedback, just move it off to the side and you'll be at that like sort of dead spot of. Uh, so when I have the two at 45 degrees is, is better than directly in front of me. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, which I, which I have actually fairly often now. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, yep. Yep, that's the uh, that's the key. I don't like those microphones, but I, that's not. Yeah, uh, I, I maybe I don't know. I don't know. I, I I just don't like the way they sound, but it's fine. It's just my my. I, I sound preference. freaking great. When, I, when, well, <laughs> and that's the thing, right? Like I was saying, you find the mic that sounds good for you, and and then go with it. That's kind of the you know, that's 
don't worry about what I like. Worry about what you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like that's the that's the thing. Yeah. Um. All right. That was that's Brian. So if you have your your if you have questions, make sure you email them to us at feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Shane had sent in a note. He says, uh, in regards to uh, last episode three nineteen, your discuss your discussion of new band members being themselves versus playing the part reminded me of the short docu series that Dream Theater made when they were searching for Mike Portnoy's replacement when they replaced their their original drummer. They were dismissing prog metal gods like Virgil Donati because they were trying to put their own spin on existing tunes when the band really wanted them to play the existing arrangements and bring their creativity to any new tunes. I recommend that series of videos in case you haven't seen it. I think they're all on YouTube and uh, he thanks us for putting out a show. So, and he says he finally has some gigs booked in October, which is exciting. So I hope that works out for you, Shane, because he says he hasn't Definitely. played. Yeah. Didn't we have a conversation once about um, when Trey sat in with the dead and, you know, I, I don't know whether he was offered the gig and I think now John Mayer has it. I don't remember that when we yeah, were Trey right played the, the, the GD 50 shows. So the last shows that were called, anything related to the name grateful dead. I think it was, was, I, I guess it was grateful dead. 50 shows is what they call those. Trey played those in it playing, you know, effectively the Jerry Garcia role, um, you know, or taking that station, if you will, not necessarily playing that role. And, uh, and then, but he didn't want the gig full time. You know, he has his own band. Actually, he's got a couple of them. Right. So, uh, so they wound up, picking up John Mayer, which I think was a sm really smart move for everybody involved. John Mayer. Gets but was it you and I that had the discussion that, that Trey, it, that people were interpreting who know Trey's chops was that he was a little stuck between trying to cop Jerry and trying to be Trey. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that that would happen to any of us, right? Like, you know, if, it, if you've been playing for a long time, it, you know, you, you, you get picked up for what effectively is a tribute band. You know, I, I and I don't mean that in a dismissive way. I just, you know, like that's what that particular thing was. It was a tribute to the Dead's 50 year career and it included most of the members, the living members of the Grateful Dead. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it like I was never a huge Dead fan. I had no emotions about it. I listened to many of those shows. I don't think I listened to all of them. But yeah, yeah I heard people say, well, he sounds, you know, halfway between what what Jerry would have played and what Trey would play. And it's like, that actually makes sense to me. I mean, <laughs> like what? But Mayor, Mayor makes it his own and kind of totally. you know, does his thing. Totally. But, you know, Mayor is like, I am a huge John Mayer fan. Yeah. I mean, I think I think he is the most interesting guitar player. I mean, Mayer sort of makes it his own. Like his tone and everything is very much driven by how, what Jerry Garcia's tone was. Well, but what I was going to say is, is that Mayor seems to have a much more natural ability to channel enough of Jerry where the nod is there and yeah. still be John Mayer. I mean, it, it doesn't yeah. seem like he's trying to, to, to channel Jerry. He, he just seems to absorb that a little bit more naturally and still be, you know, the great John Mayer that he is. Yeah. I, I don't, I wouldn't say it's any more or less natural. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if you've listened to the shows. I mean, you, you might have a different opinion, but uh, you know, I, I've, I saw him with, with John Mayer and liked what he did. I did not see him with Trey, but I, like I said, I listened to some of them. It, I, you know, it was like, okay, great. Like they didn't let Trey sing or even play enough. I thought he was pretty kind of kept in a box for most of it, which was sort of weird that they bring in this guy who's a name, you know, name brand. And you know, it's like, well, yeah. we'll just keep him in a corner, which yeah, is yeah, fine. Yeah. I, you know, like that, those shows were for, the fans of the dead, right? Yeah. Like that was, that was not, now we're going to go on tour and just grind it out every night. This was a very special thing that was putting a cap on, you know, their, their career. And that was the end of it. Right. So I, I think it's two different things. I, I, I yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I, it never sounded well, ham fisted to me other than that. It was, you know, very much clearly an orchestrated thing to be, yeah. You, you know, because it was the stakes were really high Sure, for that, for for the people who cared about it, which is everybody who was there. I, but most yeah. of the people who were there. Yeah, I think so. Well, you know, again, to bring it back to the level of you know, my band, your band, too. I mean, I'm finding now, you know, as we're working this new bass player in, we were reaping huge rewards. I mean, everybody was kind of like the band guys were kind of like. 
that's different. Is that better or worse? And you know, that you, you live with that for a couple of gigs. Yeah. And the, the guy who's trying to fit in is, is trying to say, you know, Hey, you know, I'm me, I'm not going to be that other guy, but he's, you know, wanting to please. And so he's trying to find his way to take the good of what the last guy left and, you know, then add his own thing to it. I mean, right. at, least, at least my guy is doing it, yeah. but I would have to say like, you know, especially this weekend of Nirvana gigs that I've just had, just, you know, you, you hear these beautiful different things when you let a musician just be themselves and, you know, just blossom and, you know, find their way to stuff. And if you don't hear it, it's probably not the right guy. You know, that that's one thing that you can know is like, if you really have that strong an opinion and even a good player can't, can't do something to make you feel good, you know, it, maybe it's not the right fit. Maybe, maybe the hands and the tone and the, and the style and the approach aren't the right thing. But, you know, I, at least in my opinion, I'm just hearing more and more great things from this guy that we're working in. And, um, That's and, great. Uh, and, and, and mostly he had, he had big shoes to fill, him. right. I mean, like, you, well, you know, yeah, but he has big shoes. That's, this is the thing, yeah. you know, this is what I would say. Pick a guy who has the same size shoes. They may be one guy was wearing Nikes. The other guy's wearing Pumas, but, but you know, if you got a guy you got some against Reeboks, man, what's up with that? <laughs> you go Adidas, whatever, you know, <laughs> fit in your, fit in your athletic shoe brand here. But, but yeah, I think that's the thing is you, you know, is, aren't you going to do that? Aren't you going to find a guy who, you know, has the yeah. same level of chops as someone else, or at least in the ballpark of the same level of chops and then let him do him. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's what we, we, we had a long conversation about that in fling, as we're sort of beginning this search for, you know, the, the right person to play bass here. And I, I made it very clear. I'm like, I want somebody who wants to play bass. Like I want somebody who, yep. before we ever picked up the phone to talk with them, considered themselves a bass player, you know, like, like that, that's an important, cause there was some discussion of like, well, we could find like this guy I know who plays guitar could, could maybe fill in on bass for us. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why in the world would we do that? Like, what yeah. would be the benefit of this? Yeah. And it was just like, well, you know, we know these people. I'm like, we know a lot of people. We can, like, let's, whoa, let's breathe. And we actually played on uh, on Saturday. We played with Billy, who came in and he brought his, his Fender bass and played uh. with us, which was great. You know, it was really nice because uh, Billy and I obviously have been locking in, you know, quite a bit. Uh, yeah, you're crossing the streams here, man. Your worlds collide. I, yeah, you know that makes life easier when you're trying to deal with schedules, though, because you only got one band to 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 navigate around. <laughs> so it was, there was some discussion about that. It was like, but we had a blast, and Billy, like, you know, he 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 really nailed these these tunes, especially first time playing them. You know, I mean, there were some spots where it was like, oh, you have no idea what's about to happen here. So obviously, this isn't going to go as we would expect. But you know, I mean, it, that was it was great. We had we had a blast. It sounded good. So yeah, it was, it was fun. It, we need to figure out we, we, the, you know, the four existing members of Flank. and what sucks is now I'm the new guy again. Uh, cause you know, the, uh, Burke was, was, was new after me. So now I'm the new guy in Flank. uh, hopefully only temporarily, but we need to decide how frequently we're going to get together and rehearse, how frequently we're going to wind up playing. I mean, things had kind of reset for us. We, they were resetting anyway, and then, you know, pandemic sort of put the brakes on everything. And so we've, we've been having those conversations too. Like what, well, what can, what can we realistically expect for ourselves? And then let's share those expectations with, you know, whomever it is we bring in. So make sure. Yeah. So uh, you have given me a great transition. I want to talk about one more thing today. Okay. What I want to talk about. We don't have the, to do this today. You know, if we want to spend some quality time on this topic, we could tease it up and do it next week. Well, Just here's what saying. I'm hoping will happen. I'm okay. going to let's tease it up for about 10 minutes. Okay. I really think this will touch a touch a nerve with a lot of people who listen to us yeah. and we'll get some good discussion going. So Great. what I want to talk about is practice. You want to talk about practice? I mean, listen, we talking about practice. Not a game, not a game, not a game. We talking about practice. I'd like to thank our crack production team for queuing that up. <laughs> hey man, so, that's a that's a team effort right there, making right that happen. There. Yep. <laughs> All right. So uh we're about to change as a matter of necessity how my band does practice, right? I don't live there anymore, so weekly practices are not possible. But we still do plan to get together monthly. And uh, what the general idea is, 
is no longer can we do practice the way we did before. And I, I suspect my band is like many bands that practice is, um, people come to practice with a level of preparation that they know they can get away with. Right. Uh, so some people, some people, the minimum you know, bar to hit. Well, and, but it actually depends on the person. So like Steve Strom, who was, who was my bass player, he was a preparation freak. He was ready chart, you know, maybe not memorized, but certainly prepared to play the song down and get, get it out of done out of practice in, in one rehearsal. But other guys like, ah, we don't have a gig coming up for two months. So I know we're going to keep working on this. So I, I don't need to be fully prepared. I need to be compliant. I need to be close enough that I'm not the worst guy in the band. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's <laughs> where's the bar set and that I, I would, I, I, I would agree with that. Well, you know, we had this conversation when we had David Jameson on who um, was, is the keyboard player who plays right. with the tribute bands that, you know, cover Steely Dan and Pink Floyd and, and, um, well, I can't think of the other one, but it's all Peter thing. Gabriel. Peter Gabriel, thank you very much. Yep, uh, right, Security Project, and uh, and he was saying how nice it was when he joined the first of those bands, which I think was Security Project, um, and he realized that everybody who showed up. Now remember, this is Jerry Murata's band, so you know a a, a caliber heavy cats. A heavy cats. There you go. Right. And what he really liked was that he showed up and it wasn't about what can I get away with? It was how great can I do to impress everybody else? And really it was how great can I do to just, you know, get it done. And he said it was a whole different thing and, and, and ruined him in a good way on ever being involved with, you know, I think he called them rank amateurs and he's not wrong who show up with the minimum level of preparation. He's like, that's just yeah. not how it be. And it doesn't have to be that way. And he's right. You know, it, it doesn't have to be that way, but it take it to your point. It, it takes the right type of people and, and respecting the scenario, right? That this was a band that that is a band that was going to go on the road and, you know, do all these things. And so it was like, all right, you got to show up and know your stuff. I know when I showed up for those first rehearsals with Hypnotic Clambake, I had been shedding that material hard for, you know, several weeks. So were that, they surprised you were that prepared because everybody else who came in to audition was not that was not that prepared? So my audition or? I had zero preparation for. I okay. I I met them at a gig. They they'd put an ad in the paper in Austin and they said, you know, original band, you know, I forget how they described it. I'm sure it was weird. Uh but uh you know, look at the touring band looking for a drummer for the fall. Okay, great. And so I went to their gig and I said hi to them. And then it was like, all right, you, you know, do you have time, some time tomorrow to get together? And we got together and we played and Maury just showed, it was just me and Maury, uh, the leader of the band. He brought his accordion. We just played some tunes together. He showed me the tune and, and the, you know, the kind of groove that it would be. But I, other than hearing him at the gig, I did not know the songs going into the audition. So I had that benefit of, of everybody knew that I wasn't prepared and it was okay. But once I got the gig, then it was like, all right, you know, you got whatever three and a half weeks to shed the crap out of these tunes. That was my pressure on me and learn, you know, whatever it was, four albums worth of material and just come in and know it so that there's no questions. And so I learned all the drum parts, all the breaks in the songs The you know, I internalized the tunes and learned all the harmonies because I didn't know who else was singing what. So I just learned everything and showed up. And if they were to answer your question, if they were surprised, they didn't show it. It was like, yep. OK, everybody else here has been playing these tunes. So, you know, if you're going to be the weak link and slow us down, we get, we're going to have a real problem because we've only got a week to rehearse before we, you know, get out on the road. And, um, you know, we had, I don't know, five, four or five days, probably five days yeah. of, of, you know, six hour rehearsals. And, and so, so there you go. So, so it wasn't rehearsal. It, it was, it was rehearsal, it. not yes. practice. I did practice yes. at home. I got yeah. there for rehearsals and everybody came to the first rehearsal knowing all their parts. The point of the rehearsal was to get it to gel together. Yeah. Yep. All right. So l let me just rephrase this. There's not a universal fit here. You know, right. Right. For some bands rehearsal time is hang time. It's bonding time. It's, it's, it's whatever it is. And let's, let's jam a little and you know, let's work some stuff out. You know, uh, which is kind of really what the house rockers rehearsals had been some kind of combination of taking, a, taking songs through the funnel, new songs through the funnel of preparing them to play. But again, I, I could see that, 
the preparation was a, a, a list of subjective decision-making on a band member by man member basis about how much time should I spend on it in advance of this rehearsal because how much likely is it I'm going to need, need it to be ready to go the next week or that weekend or something like that. Yeah. And so the, the flip side of this is, you know, I'm going to come up once a month. We want to add 20 new songs next year. The, and I'm coming up with like this criteria of, you know, new songs. How long are we all willing to spend on a new song? You know, you know we want to move fa fairly fastly through these. A good example is uh, we have a, ha a Halloween gig coming up, right? And we want to play a song we've played in the past, but we it's, it's a hard song. It's not hard in terms of like the musicality of it, it's hard in terms of the roadmap. Dead Man's sure. Party by Oingo Boingo. Oh yeah, you got to know that tune. You got to know, like you it's said, the roadmap. Weird freaking roadmap, right? Yep. And yep. It, you know, it just doesn't stick if you unless you play it all the time. And we had a long time. You know, there's there's odd there's odd uh, tempo measures in it, and the, you know, there's just a few different odd time signatures. So, yep. um, so I said to the guys, I would like to play this on our on our October 30th gig. We do not have time to rehearse. Before October 30th, we are going to re rehearse the morning of October 30th. The expectation is you come ready to knock this out. We're spot check it in one rehearsal. We don't really want to do it in a, um, in a, in a sound check somewhere. Uh, yeah. We don't really have that much time to, yeah. it, we really need to, I want to be able to play it through two, but literally the, the gauntlet is thrown down. It is expected for you to come ready with this difficult song. You know, your part. If everybody does that, we should be able to run it two or three times and be ready to go. And so that's an expectation. We'll see how that goes. It's just very different how we've done rehearsals in the past. Yeah, because but if, you can, you know, if you can successfully, this is a great, I like where this is going because you're, you're not saying show up and know these 20 songs. You're saying show up and know this one song. And so the, the, um, the bar really isn't all that high for someone to do all of the work that it takes to get there. And then you get to show up hopefully with 10 people fully prepped and everyone gets to experience what that level of success is like. And right. maybe that's a good way to sort of set the reset, the bar for your band going forward. Maybe. I think what, I think what moving forward is going to look like is each rehearsal and our rehearsals are, our rehearsals are an hour of vocal rehearsal and then two hours of full band rehearsal. That's that's so we do a three hours and sure. you know a little bit of break time. Yep. I, if I was to guess right now, the way I'm thinking of structuring it is probably two songs, three if if one of them is like brain dead easy. Sure, new songs, and then we have many, many, many horn charts and you know back catalog of stuff that you know has has fallen off that, you know, deserves another look, you know, we have, we have some really cool music and really yeah. great, interesting charts. So I think, you know, a rehearsal is going to be seven or eight songs, two or three of which are new, the rest of which will be bringing back. So, you, you know, you've played these songs before, so you just got to dust them off and, you know, come ready. So, and I think that's, that's reasonable for a month's head notice of preparation time. Yeah. No, that's, that sounds realistic. Sure. Yeah. 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 And, and like the trick is, to ch hopefully change that mindset of, you know, don't think about who is going to be weaker than you and, and, you know, <laughs> use that as the bar. Yeah. Think about well, who's going to be stronger than you and use that as the bar. If, if you, know, you want to use it that way. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you hundred percent. Optimistically, the bar didn't become the bar. It's not a sin of commission. It's more like we've all eased into this together because there was no, there was no, urgency, you know, to getting stuff done. And I think the guys will respond really well to it. I mean, I think that they will be on it. It's a, it's not an unreasonable request, right? It's not like learn 50 songs. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. Did you see that one post somebody wrote about, um, they got asked to audition and they, they were asked to prepare 20 songs for an audition showed up for the audition. And, um, you know, people were really dismissive of them and, you know, you know, there were, it was more a rehearsal and, and, you know, the guy felt like he was an, an afterthought to this after preparing 20 friggin' songs for an audition and, uh, and, you know, basically walked out, you know, before the audition was over saying, you guys just don't have your act together. Oh, like, so the, the, the audition, you er, the person or the audition E, the person that was, was 
showing up to audition for this band knew the songs better than the band did? Is that what? No, no. I'm oh. just simply saying that, 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 uh, you know, the band was kind of chattering that they weren't focused on the, ah. giving the guy the respect that he, you know, like really listening to him, they were treating it like just a rehearsal and, um, and he happened to be there, but he oh. was really pushed out of shape because I, I don't know about you. My, my, my auditions are three to five songs. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. That, I mean, that's realistic. Yeah. 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 And I actually made the mistake. I, I kind of close this part of the discussion this way. I think a lot of bands and a lot of rehearsals are um, exercises in the path of least resistance. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of bands where you yeah. throw an ad up on Craigslist, three guys show up, the best of the three, even if they're not your dream guy, I'd rather have a guy yeah. and be able to keep moving the band forward. And, you know, the, like the lack of, you know, not real interest in patience and searching for a great guy. Yep. And so you kind of get these amalgams of, of uh, personalities that, you know, if you really had your choice, you might wait and, you know, keep looking. Right. Yep. But I think people take the path least resistance and you take the path least resistance in rehearsals as well. And you're probably not as hard on yourself to accomplishing stuff as you might want to be. You may not want to be that. I mean, again, you're, I hear a lot, you know, our band vibe is we get together, we have a drink, you know, we, you know, we hang out, we catch up on each other's families, we play a little bit of music, we see where we are at the end, and then we figure out what we'll do at the next rehearsal or not. And um, so that concept of path of least resistance seems to permeate a lot of the semi-professional band That's, mantra. I, I, I would I would agree with that. I mean, it, it not all of it, but sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it depends on, like, you can you can alter that with an agenda. You can, you know, like there, there are ways of imposing structure without removing the, you know, hang time aspect of, of rehearsal of a, you know, of right. a band of friends, as opposed to a band of working, you know, a band that just works. And it, if friendships develop fine, but this is, you know, this is a gig and a job and we're going to do it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it. There's no one way and no one way. a lot of bands work out. I'd love to hear what you folks think. Gig Gab uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com would be the place to send us your thoughts on uh, on all of this, because I know some of you are just banging on the steering wheel saying, guys, but what about? Well, that's what feedback at giggabpodcast.com is for. That's where you send that stuff in and then we read it on the show and then everybody else hears it and the conversation keeps going and that's how it works. That's what gig gap is. You got anything else for today, my friend? I do not, my friend. All right. Well, then uh, we're on our way out from uh, another successful week here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us. What's that thing we say, even if it's rehearsal? Always. Always. Keep performing. That'll work. Well, there's some types of performing that don't work at rehearsal. I don't know.